Welcome to Inspect the Uninspected, the show dedicated to answering all the questions you never knew you should even ask. Who needs an inspection? What needs an inspection? What can be inspected? What could you expect to get from an inspection? Real solutions for real people? Cost effective? Simple answers. What do you look for? Who do you ask? Where do you go for help? It's all right here. Commercial, residential. You're buying. You should have, in my opinion, an engineering-based home inspection company. A civil engineering-based home inspection company should inspect it. Otherwise, you're open to surprise. Keeping it simple. Welcome to Inspect the Uninspected. I'm Andy Christie from Safe Homes Canada. We specialize in century home inspections. Today, we're inspecting a century home in downtown Barrie, Ontario. This is going to be great because we're going to show people exactly what the process looks like, and we're going to blow up all those myths. People think century home basements are wet. They're wet because of human nature. The same principles of building sciences apply at century homes as they do at normal houses, or newer houses, I should say. We're going to show you what that's all about and a whole bunch of other things. So how do you inspect a building? A lot of people think it's about technology. It's really not about technology. It's about tenacity. The first thing I do at every building is look at the lines of the building. How vertical is it? How plumb is it? Is everything level? Is everything square? You gather your clues as you move through. First thing we're going to do right now is look at how vertical this building is, how plumb it is. That's critical because sometimes you're presented with clues that suggest excessive or differential settlement at the foundation level. Those clues, we use them as we go through the entire process. It helps us understand the history of the building. When I look at the corners of a building, I want to see vertical lines on behalf of my clients and for me too, if I'm buying a building. So when you look at that line of the building, that corner, it's vertical. It suggests these foundation walls are solid, stable. They are where they were built 115 and a half years ago, whatever that number is. The more vertical lines you see, the better that I see, the better I feel about the building. When you look at this left side of the house here, left looking from the road at the front of the house, I see a line that is perfect. It's absolutely dead plumb. Awesome stuff. I'm trying not to look at anything but the lines of the building. There's so much here to look at. We'll talk more about brick in a minute. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is I want to see the outside face of the foundation wall. We're going to do a lap on this building. This is our process. A lap on the building thinking about nothing but foundation walls, entry points for water, and evidence of water entry. We're, look, we're looking at those places or for those places where water could go through the wall, into the wall, into the basement. Can't actually see the outside face of the foundation right here. We have to dig a little bit. So, most common entry point for water basement windows. What do you do? Hey, let's tell people to keep their window walls clean. Quite often, the elevation of the earth down inside the window well is higher than the window sill itself. These people, if you look at those vertical joints on the side of the window, somebody here has put some energy into sealing those joints. Aha! However, the bottom of the window is a little bit open. So we'll get, the, we'll get somebody to seal that up. If you do the simple things right, it usually results in a dry base. It's all about so what happens is people call the guy that owns a big backhoe and he, and he seals basement foundation walls for a living. And they, they use him as a consultant. They say, we've got water in our basement. What do we need to do? And he says, I think you need to dig around. The I'm thinking, cock the joint at the basement window, capture water at the troughs, get your down pipes away from the building, seal the obvious entry points for water. That applies to every single building. Okay. So this is the rear part of the building. It's obviously an addition. The original structure is over there, central home, and then at some point in the not too distant past, somebody added to the building. I can see by looking at this foundation wall that it's almost certainly concrete block with a parging system on the outside. So this is a cementitious parging system. 
it's it's the way you build block walls. If I'm building a building, I'm probably not building with block because it has cavities and it has mortar joints. It has it's more unforgiving than a poured concrete wall. A poured concrete wall is solid chocolate at Easter. Uh, a concrete block wall is the hollow chocolate. It's more unforgiving. You have to do everything right as a homeowner when you have block walls. We'll show you what that means. This is a normal stress crack right there. I just know from experience. Do you need to dig down and seal that stress crack? Well, we have to look at the wall from the other side. Whatever's on the other side of this wall, if it's wet in this area, then I'm going to recommend that the owner of the home dig down and fully seal that crack. If it's completely dry, I don't want them to waste their energy. I want them to have beautiful meals and go on trips and keep money in their wallet. Downpipe, right? Is that far enough away from the building? Not at block walls. So I would suggest this downpipe be extended further away from the building. Some people use perforated, this is called big O pipe. This is just white big O pipe. Some people buy the pipe and they get perforated pipe. That doesn't work because the water just leaks out of the perforations of the pipe. You need solid pipe. And at, in this situation, I'd say maybe five or six feet away from the building would be fine. Water control is critical at block walls. If you dump water against the block wall, it's going in the block, almost invariably. Unless the home is built on a sand dune, so parts of Wasega Beach, for example, you can dump water all day long against the house, and it's just going down to the sand. I love sand. I love the beach. So what we have on this, we're on the right side of the house. We're on the right side of the block foundation wall. We're on the right side of the addition. So what we have here is we've got, we've got a, a face of the wall, a surface of the wall that doesn't have any parging on it. So I'm open to the possibility that this part of the structure was built to be the garage. Because the building code, when this was built, did not require that parging be applied. Parging and damp proofing. Parging being the, the, the stucco-like material. Damp proofing is the tar. The building code did not require that that system be applied at the outside face of garage foundation wall. So even though this looks like part of the house right now, it may have been a garage at some point. That's probably why it's not part. So we don't know right now what's under here. This could be a concrete slab on grade. So if it's a concrete slab on grade, i.e. no basement below it, then we don't really need to worry about water entry down into a space below this floor, probably. What do we need to worry about, though? We have these little cracks and openings. Long term, if you, let, if you allow water to go into these little gaps and openings, the building, this wall is susceptible to possible freezing damage. That's why things heave and move, the power of the ice, the glaciers, wow. So um, my recommendation to my people is going to be, you know what, I'm not going to recommend significant digging, but whatever's available, maybe scrape the stone away a little bit here, and then just uh, inject a little bit of hydraulic cement into these openings or similar something to stop the water from going in because the water's going to freeze and when it freezes bad things happen okay so if you want water to go in your basement if you want to maximize the probability of further settlement at the foundation level further cracking at the foundation level don't have any eaves troughs so here there's no eaves trough so first thing you do at any building but eaves troughs in the building, plenty of fasteners. For some reason, people skimp on fasteners at eaves troughs. We're here in Canadian weather. We're in Barrie, Ontario. We get hit hard, and we need lots of fasteners because there's ice damming. There's ice. There's always ice forming. You can, you can do everything correctly in the attic, insulation, ventilation, build it right, and still you're going to get ice damming because there's a solar factor for various reasons, but primarily the sun melts snow in the daytime, ice in the daytime, and then it freezes at the end of the day. It's just what happens here. So. Put eaves troughs in the building, nice hardy ones with lots of fasteners. Get the downpipes away. That's your starting point for a dry basement and a happy, uh, successful structure, solid structure well into the future. A happy structure. Everybody should have a happy structure. Okay, I need a big ladder going to the roof. Okay, so want to have no troughs up here? What's going to happen is the water gets focused on a line of shingles and it will, pre, it will prematurely degrade your shingles, right? So yeah, I would recommend, I'm going to recommend, knees drop, knees drop here, capture the water, bring it down, down to the ground on the left side of the building. Simple 
and it prevents a uh, repair. So if you look at these shingles, they're newer, but many of the nails haven't been fully sunk. So here's the guy with the nail gun. He thinks he's uh, Al Pacino in Scarface, and uh, they rush the job. You, if they're going to they're going to use a nail gun, you need to fully sink every single nail, and it has to be flush with the sheathing. You have to be nailing into something, right? Uh, otherwise, you end up with this stuff. What can happen is, I mean, this may be partly a function of the planks below. Like, the plank sheathing below is probably uneven, too. So this stuff here, this stuff right here is probably a function of that, too. But look, watch this. Oh, look. Nails sunk on an angle. Look at that. That is called Fire the Roofer. Let's, let's rename the show. We're going to call the show Fire the Contractor. We even have a penetration point. There's a hole right in the shingle where the nail head went through it. Let's call the roofer back, and we're going to be short and, and, uh, and stiff with him. We're not going to be congenial or nice. And we're going to say, oh, maybe we should be nice. And we're going to say, please come back and fully sink all the nails and patch the shingles through which the nail heads have penetrated because, oh, yeah, we don't want the roof to leak. And they've already paid for a new roof, and now there are holes in the shingles. So there you go. Come on back, Mr. Roofer, and do your job properly. Okay, so the other things we can talk about here, there's obviously a, a big honk and stress crack right in. This is a decorative block system, perhaps. I haven't even looked at this stuff yet. But some kind of parging, maybe. We've got a big stress crack in it. What do we do there at this point? Foam's a bit ugly, but, you know, at least somebody's made an attempt to seal it up. We have another crack right down here below the window. I'm going to have our people seal that up. I would just, I tend to overuse uh, high-quality compounds like hydraulic cement and just goop it in there you know you could try mastic but that would be black or uh that would look horrible so that's the wrong product but uh it's going to be painted anyway whatever goes because this system's painted the other thing right in front of our eyes here uh there's no formal flashing at the junction where the low roof meets the high wall so this junction right here so you really want to maintain i don't want my people up here every year recocking this joint i want to help them minimize maintenance at their house. So how do you do that? You do things intelligently and proactively. And here, it's a metal flashing. Even now, you can just wrap it down to here, wrap it up to here, carefully fasten it to, to the masonry system, and then cock the joints at the flashing. Done. Keep it simple. Oh, here's one here. There you go. This is an awkward profile. Because it's not a smooth surface, they have a big caulking joint at the top there, so it's not a perfect situation. But somebody's actually done a really nice job on that, sealing that up. I would probably seal the bottom one too, just because we can't predict, we can't quantify what's going to happen. Hey, whoever added the insulation didn't put a skirt on the access. A skirt would keep the insulation inside the attic, which is a really great idea. <coughs> <laughs> Makes me cough. Actually, there is a skirt, but it's broken. Uh, one of the things I like to do in an attic space, this is a little bit over the top here. I mean, if an inspector refused to come up in this attic, it's kind of understandable. Number one, it's hard to tell where the joists are in an attic like this. Through this, all this insulation. Um, we've already made a mess because there's no proper skirt at the access, so I'm making a bit more of a mess. So what, right? Um, one of the keys here. I've dug test holes down through the insulation to make sure there's no back guano, like layers of back guano underneath, which I find sometimes, and to make sure there's no wood chip insulation, whatever. We just want to know what's down there, right? And vermiculite. I have to make sure there's no vermiculite under the loose insulation. I often find vermiculite, which may or may not contain asbestos, down under this insulation, right? So right here, they, whatever they did, they, they removed the old insulation, and this is newer loose cellulose insulation, and it's about R30-something. I'm probably going to suggest the buyer add a little bit more, but it's not critical work. Another thing here, normal cracking at a rafter, no big deal. Solid rafter. We've got some older wires behind me there. They're not knob and tube wires, but they're older. Most older wires are okay. Plank sheathing, right? Just because it's plank doesn't mean you have to put plywood or wafer board over it. Sometimes it's necessary if it's a really uneven surface, right? So obviously there's some water staining on it. It's been here for 120 years or whatever. Oh, look at this, look at this. 
See the geometry of the top of the rafter assembly? See how true it is? Notwithstanding the one cracked rafter down there, but it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive overall. The structure is pretty impressive. <laughs> okay, I'm getting out of this dust environment. So, sometimes to get in an attic, you destroy the skirt, you disturb the insulation significantly. Just opening the hatch here resulted in a, a, a storm of loose cellulose insulation landing on the floor in this beautiful bedroom. So, part of being a home inspector is cleaning up your mess. It's just the way it is. So, it doesn't bother me a bit. You know, I, I feel badly, um, you know, making a mess in people's houses. It's an invasive process, so we got to clean up our mess. So, you're interviewing a home inspector. You're asking them, what are they going to do? They should tell you, when you talk about windows, that they're going to open and close and carefully examine every single window in the house. That's what you have to do as a thorough inspector. The one window you skip will have vapors inside of it or it'll be cracked, right? So even a newer window, you want to open it, it opens okay, shuts okay, it's nice and square, it locks okay. Lift the blind, make sure you're not missing a little crack at the top or something, right? This is about thorough work. In this house, we've gone through every single power receptacle to understand what's grounded and what's not. We've gone through every single pipe, we understand what's leaking, what's not. Don't skip anything. The second you cut a corner, you're doomed. Look, I'm in Paris. It's a very elegant bathroom, but it doesn't have an exhaust fan, right? So how can people control relative humidity in their houses and prevent mold production without spending a bunch of money? It's easy. They do all the things we've already talked about. Keep water from coming in the building envelope. Get water away from the building. Have a dry basement. And then put an exhaust fan in the bathroom where you bathe with a timer on it. So when you rush off to work or wherever you're going, throw the timer on for 20 minutes sucks the moist air out of the house, then that, that prevents mold production. Heat recovery ventilators are similar, but heat HRVs, let's call them, the acronym. An HRV is like an exhaust fan, not quite as powerful, more consistent. It's more of a long-term thing, uh, but it has a heat exchanger in it. So the money you spent to heat the air inside the house or to heat the house, the money doesn't go outside with the warm air like it does with an exhaust fan. So exhaust fans are great. Heat recovery ventilators are a little bit better help keep the heat in the building. In any case, we need to control relative humidity and prevent condensation at windows. Why? To prevent mold production, because people get really upset and scared when they see mold. There you go, it's so simple. Old floor members often rot from the bottom up. If the basement was really wet back in the day, so you'll find pockets of moisture decay sometimes. You can usually see it looks curvy in the bottom if they're rotted up inside. Um, I, I make a lot of noise when I inspect floor assemblies. If you have a home inspector who's not noisy, then you need a new home inspector because you have to pound the wood to see if the wood's solid or if it's suffered significant moisture decay. I'm gonna check every single floor joist and every single beam for moisture decay in this basement because that's the only way to do the job. Quite often you will find a pocket of moisture decay here, a little bit over there, most of the floor assemblies okay. That's sort of the most common scenario. So you can't just check one or two joists. I know a lot of inspectors don't check any joists. Looking at it is useless. That's a key. Foundation wall. Here we go. I love this wall, you know? Again, I've heard people say, if you have stone walls, you should rip them out and pour concrete on. It's ridiculous. Uh, this wall has been here for, what, 100 and some odd years. At some point, somebody poured a little concrete curb to uh, help provide support. They probably, they probably made the basement more deep at some point, and this is what they did. It's great. You know, you can walk around down here now. Awesome. I'm happy. I'm happy at work. Um, so these walls naturally inhibit slash prevent water infiltration. Um, it's dry down here. It smells dry. It looks dry. We don't see any evidence of water infiltration. What's a key as an inspector? I tell people, I'm not going to guarantee that you're not going to get water in the basement, but what I'm going to guarantee you is if you do all the simple things, those inexpensive eaves trough, sealing your building envelope, sealing the window, if you do all those things correctly and you, and you pay attention to your building, you're going to minimize the probability of water entry. And if you do get water entry, I guarantee it's probably going to be an inexpensive solution. Don't believe the guy that tells you automatically, we have to do all this significant digging, it's going to be major, we're going to shut down the neighborhood. Please get off my property, buddy. We're not doing that. 
Just do the seal a crack. If you have a crack, if you have an entry point for water, seal that entry point. Keep it simple. So we're also looking for galvanized pipes. Insurance companies don't like those. Um, we're looking for knob and tube wiring. I've had a good look through this wiring. And what you've got is a combination of newer looking wiring. And there's a, there are a few older looking circuits, but they're okay. Like usually, usually this kind of stuff, it's all about what's grounded and what's not grounded. If you have power near water, it has to be grounded or GFCI protected if it's ungrounded. GFCI is ground fault circuit interrupter, way more safe around water than a normal grounded circuit or an ungrounded circuit. We have a galvanized pipe right here. So this here is a galvanized pipe. You know, it's an older pipe that's, you know, it could be a lead pipe. In, other, in any case, it's not a new copper pipe. It's not a new plastic. I'm thinking we need a bit of support of that copper pipe, actually. Um, so we'll recommend our buyer put a little strap there. Um, this pipe, the silvery looking one, the insurance company is going to be unhappy about that and they want to minimize risk. So, so they're going to make the buyer in a likelihood remove that pipe. Who can blame them? But I don't want to, I wouldn't want to pay a higher premium because that's the other option, right? So again, a dry basement, couple of galvanized pipes, electrical. We don't have any big issues on electrical. This wall over here, you know, we have a few stones here that are sort of, it looks a little precarious. What I'm going to recommend here to our client is just that they maybe pack a little bit of mortar in here. You know, it would, I think it would be over the top at this point to start pouring a concrete wall against it. Um, you know, it, it probably, as an engineering professional, I have to use words like likely and maximize probabilities, blah, 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 engineering speak. But, um, you know, it probably looks worse than it is. I mean, a big part of my job is sort of calming everybody down regarding these health issues and structural issues. And, you know, it's like a big Lego set. It's, um, it's, structures are simple. Uh, civil engineering is about gravity, water, stone. Uh, it's not really complicated stuff. We can simplify it nicely for people, I think, and take their stress away, especially in an old building. Beautiful wood. Look at this. Look at this. Look at these hardwood. It's probably hardwood, right? It may or may not be hardwood. It's a little furry looking, so maybe it is softwood. But these are, these are gorgeous, amazing plank floor sheathing up here. And these joists, awesome, big, beautiful. I'm happy. It's a celebration. It's a structural celebration. And I, and I want our people to feel good about these stone walls, you know, except the ones that are a little precarious, but most of the stone walls. And they should feel amazing about this floor assembly because it's awesome. And no asbestos on the ducts. Woo. Of course, it doesn't have to be a fashion statement to go in the crawl space. I'm going in. I need a spider stick. This is kind of Stephen King level in here. Nice solid wood. You know, this is what I would call high and dry. Pretty sandy, right? So the main concern here is moisture decay at the floor assembly. In a crawl space like this, the main source of water is plumbing leak. Oh yeah, you want to be a home inspector, eh? So this here, you know, they cut a hole in this big stone wall. Whenever. One of the things I'm looking for here is I look at these ducts. I'm looking for asbestos. I'm always looking for asbestos and knob and tube wiring. All kinds of life safety stuff, right? There's, there's three or, there are three or four different kinds of asbestos. I'm coming out. So we've inspected the heck out of this house. We've been under the building, in the crawl space, through the attic, on the roof, hands on the brick, hands on the stone. We've done the life safety stuff, the window stuff, the everything stuff. We've, we've executed a process here that will prevent our clients from having a nasty surprise later. That's the essence of integrity-driven home inspection. That's what home inspection should be about. People are spending huge amounts of money. They need professionals to take care of them. No excuses. Oh, there's, we can't go in the attic because it's too dusty. We can't go in the crawl space because of the spiders. Whatever. Do your job. Get it done. The process here is very similar to the process that we execute at a brand new house or a 40-year-old house. It's a little different because we have our little tricks to find asbestos and back one and stuff like that, but the process is very similar. It works that way. You, you, you minimize the probability of missing things 
by staying within your process. Andy Christie here at a 120 and a half year old building in downtown Barrie, Ontario. Inspect the Uninspected.